wind is howling at the top of the cliff near to the church. You can see the silhouette of the castle ruins with the moon rising behind it. As you enter the graveyard on the church grounds, you notice a glowing figure walking amongst the headstones. It starts to hover towards you. Your heart is racing. It turns and disappears behind the church. Welcome to Ghost Tales by the Fireside. I am Clem Dalloway, and in this episode, I'll be telling some of the many ghost stories from the wonderful historic town of Bridge North. The town of Bridge North is in the county of Shropshire in England. The town is split into two by the River Severn, with Low Town on the east side and High Town on the west. The town is named after a bridge that once went across the River Severn during the Anglo Saxon period. The daughter of King Alfred the Great, Ethelfleda, known as the Lady of the Mercians, constructed a mound on the west side of the River Severn to defend against the attacking Danes in 912. The mound is believed to have been in the same location as Bridge North Castle. Ethelfleda ruled Mercia from 911 until her death on the 12th of June, 918. The manor of Bridge North was granted to Roger de Montgomery after the Norman conquest. In 1101, the manor was granted to the son of Roger de Montgomery, Robert of Bellamy, the third Earl of Shrewsbury, who constructed a castle and a church on the site of the modern day town. However, he lost his lands and castles after he joined forces with Robert Curthos and invaded England against Henry I. He was banished from England and returned to Normandy. The town became a royal borough and the castle was used to defend attacks from the Welsh. In the 12th century, there were five gates to enter Bridge North. The only one that survived is North Gate, which was rebuilt in brick in the 18th century and then refaced with sandstone blocks in 1911. In 1642, Royalist troops led by Sir Robert Howard were garrisoned at Bridge North during the English Civil War and it became one of the main strongholds of the Midlands. Parliamentarian soldiers, led by Oliver Cromwell, attacked the town in 1646, and after a three-week siege, they defeated the Royalists and were ordered to destroy the castle. During the attack, Royalist soldiers retreated to the castle and set fire to some of the stables on Lisley Street, near to where the library now stands. St. Leonard's Church was used for ammunition storage and was set alight, causing a great fire, destroying most of Hightown. Only a few of the 16th and 17th century buildings survived. The castle was surrendered to the Royalists on the 26th of April, 1646, and was destroyed over the next year. The only surviving part is a tower of the old keep which is said to lean more than the Tower of Pisa. You can still see the caves that had been dug out at the foot of the cliff in Lowtown, where the parliamentarians threatened to blow the castle up with dynamite. Bridge North is a market town that once had a thriving river port. Because of the many sailors using the river, the town had a lot of inns and alehouses, the earliest recorded in 1203. From 1804 to 1815, 
Hazeldean's foundry in Lowtown built steam locomotives for the new booming railroad network. The most famous locomotive was called Catch Me If You Can, which was the fourth and last steam locomotive designed by the inventor Richard Trevithick. It was the first locomotive to carry paying customers who were charged at one shilling a ride. When Bridge North Railway opened in 1862, the river trade began to decline and finally stopped in 1895. On East Castle Street stands the Governor's House, built in 1633 and named after Sir Robert Howard, who lived in the house while commanding the Royalist troops in Bridge North during the English Civil War. The grand houses on this road reflect on the very wealthy past of the merchants who traded from the River Severn. In 1642, Charles I stayed in the house with two of his sons. When he looked from across the top of Hightown, he commented, the finest view in all of my kingdom. In 1954, a pistol was found wrapped in a beautiful fabric that was from the 17th century with the initials R.H. engraved on it. It's most likely to have belonged to Sir Robert Howard. Perhaps he hid it when the parliamentarians attacked. Visitors to the house have claimed to have seen the ghost of a little old lady, dressed in period clothing, who sits at the top of the stairs. She confronts people, asking who they are and what they are doing in the house before she fades away. The sound of horses galloping down the road have been heard that seem to stop outside the governor's house. After the sound stops, people have reported hearing soldiers getting down off their horses and marching towards the house, and then the sound of the door opening. The loud footsteps carry on as if many people have spread out all over the house, as if they are searching for someone. And then it all stops. Silence. When witnesses have looked around afterwards, they found the front door to be shut and no trace of anyone entering the property. The Church of St. Mary Magdalene was built in 1792 on the foundations of the original Norman church. One evening, a lady staying at one of the local bed and breakfasts decided to take an evening stroll around the church. As she approached the graveyard, she noticed a silhouetted figure walking between the graves. She assumed it was just another person walking around the grounds who looked like she was searching for something. But as she got closer, she noticed that she wasn't touching the floor. She was floating. Even though the woman was shocked by the sight of this apparition, she kept on watching it until she walked towards the back of the church and faded away. The ghost in the castle ruins is very similar to the ghost at the governor's house on East Castle Street. Invisible and is also thought to be from the English Civil War. The sound of a horse galloping on the stone road is heard before the sound of someone running towards the ruin. It is thought to be the ghost of a rider warning the royalists of the approaching parliamentarian army. The Seven Valley Railway Heritage Line runs from Bridge North, passing through some of the most picturesque countryside in Shropshire and Worcestershire, and finishes in Kidderminster. There was once a line that ran to Wolverhampton that used to run through a tunnel in the cliffs of Hightown. The tunnel was closed in the 1960s when the railway closed, but the ghost of a man has been seen many times in and around the tunnel who is believed to have been hit and killed by a cart during the construction of the railway. During World War II, one of the home guards was patrolling the area when he noticed a man walking from the tunnel that seemed to be surrounded by a strange glow. He walked towards the soldier and then disappeared. Years later, a Mr. and Mrs. Reynolds saw the same man emerging from the tunnel and disappeared, just as the soldier explained. 
They believed that seeing him was a sign of oncoming doom. In 2004, a group of people who were around Northwood Holt near Budley said that they could feel the vibrations on the track as if a train was coming, but the railway was closed at the time. They suddenly saw a large mist coming towards them in the shape of a train. On the same night, other people reported the same misty shape heading towards Bridge North Station. Many people travelling on the trains have reported seeing a man and a little girl, dressed in Edwardian costume, standing on the platform, waving at passengers, but are not around when people have got off the train. The original George Hotel was on the opposite side of the road of where it stands now, and was a coaching inn, until it was demolished to make room for the railway embankment. It was first licensed in 1790, and after it moved over the road to 11 Hollybush Road in 1842, it became the main hotel in Bridgenorth as it was closest to the train station. At one time in the later part of the 20th century, it was renamed the Hollyhead Hotel, after the owner a Mr. Hollyhead. During his time at the hotel, he had heard that many people had experienced some strange goings on in the property. One of the bedrooms had a reputation for having the feeling of someone being in the room when no one else was there, and the room would go cold. One man who stayed in the hotel for a number of months claimed that he would often smell the scent of an expensive lady's perfume in the room. Around seven years after the Hollyheads took over the hotel, they had extensive renovations on the ground floor, which they believed was the cause of more supernatural events to occur. They would often hear a clicking noise from upstairs, like the sound of a light switch being turned on and off continuously. During the renovation, a wall was taken down in a passageway, and every night when locking up, there always seemed to be a cold chill that made the hairs on the back of the neck stand up. One night after everyone had left the bar, Mr. Hollyhead stayed in the bar talking with a friend, when he suddenly noticed someone standing beyond the bar. When he took a proper look, he saw that the figure was fading. At the same time, his friend cried out, saying that he felt like he was burning and believed that he was covered in flames. He beat his hands frantically on his clothing to put the flames out, when it suddenly stopped. They both said that they could smell burning. The White Lion Inn was first licensed in 1760 and has had many ghost sightings. Upstairs in the pub, people have seen a lady who walks along the corridor, carrying a basket and who wears a bonnet and a black shawl. She is thought to have committed suicide in the property in the 18th century, and she left two children behind. Two children also haunt the pub, and it is believed that they could be the children that she left behind. One morning, the landlord went downstairs to clean the pub before opening. And after cleaning the bar, he went on to another part of the pub to do his daily morning routine. On returning to the bar, he noticed an old penny dating from the early 1900s that wasn't there when he was cleaning the bar. He put it to one side and didn't really pay any more attention to it until the next day when it happened again and again on the following day, each time with a different penny. A week later, two ladies visiting the pub claimed to be mediums and said they had picked up on two children. The ladies said that the children were sad because he hadn't paid attention to them after they had left gifts and he hadn't thanked them for the pennies. Customers have said that they've seen an old man sitting at the bar who has a dog at his feet. They always say that he's been seen very briefly from the corner of their eye. 
When described, they all described the exact same thing. A man wearing a flat cap with a dog at his feet. It describes an old frequent customer who passed away years ago. Another ghost that haunts the pub is that of a lady in white. She wears a long flowing white dress and is reputed to appear before an impending death. The Friars Inn on St. Mary's Street was originally known as the Head and Chickens and was a coaching inn in the early 17th century. One night, a barman was fetching crisps from the cellar to stock up the shelves behind the bar. When he suddenly rushed up the stairs screaming, he emerged looking very pale as if he had been scared by something. He was told to take a rest and calm down. While he was sat at one of the tables in the busy bar, he explained that he'd put his arm under a low shelf to fetch the crisps and a hand grabbed his wrist and tried to pull him under. He said it was extremely strong, but he managed to escape the struggle. There was no way that someone could have been able to hide under the shelves or behind the shelves. People have also witnessed a monk in the bar and a ghost walks through the wall into the building next door. The crown was first mentioned in records in 1646 and may have suffered damage from the Great Fire during the English Civil War. The pub was first licensed in 1710 and in 1723 it was used for the court's quarterly sessions. Towards the last part of the 18th century, the Crown was known as the Crown Inn and Royal Hotel, and it had a small theatre at the back of the pub called the Cockpit Theatre, which was also used for cockfights. In 1894, the Crown and adjoining hotel, the Raven, were purchased by Broadway Brewery, and it was joined together and was renamed the Crown and Raven which was the only AA2 star hotel in the town. In 1968, the hotel was refitted and became just a pub. But most of the original building was demolished to make way for the new Woolworths store. The Crown has two entrances, one on High Street and the other on Whitburn Street, which was the original entrance for the Raven. The inn is supposedly haunted by a chambermaid called Evie who discovered that her husband was having an affair. In a rage, she murdered the other woman and was convicted and hanged for the crime. Many people have said they have experienced the ghost of Evie. When the pub was still called the Crown and Raven, a previous landlord would often hear noises that he couldn't explain, including footsteps when no one was around and the compressed air in the cellar would turn on and off. A past landlady, who had two German Shepherd dogs, who refused to go upstairs into the flat. They would sit outside the door, with their fur standing up, and would refuse to move. She once employed a man part-time to bottle up in the mornings. One morning she went downstairs and said hello to the man. He replied saying, Good morning, at least you're more sociable than the other woman who was here this morning. He told her that a woman came in and just stood behind the bar. When he spoke to her, she didn't reply and just stood there. The landlady couldn't explain this as the pub was locked up and no one else was there. She once held a seance and the results amazed her. She was given a message from a spirit who said that she was a 19 year old chambermaid who was engaged to get married. But she found out that he was having an affair so she killed the other girl. She was executed for the murder. Number 11 High Street stands on the corner of High Street and Whitburn Street. This building was once a sweet shop with living quarters above. There was once a cleaning lady who used to clean the living quarters, who always felt uneasy when she was in the property. She asked a friend to join her, 
so that she'd feel more secure. So the friend joined her and brought her dog along. As soon as the dog entered the building, its fur stood up and refused to go upstairs. One time, two decorators were employed to redecorate the living quarters at night. One of the decorators was feeling tired, so we decided to rest on the sofa in the living room. He fell asleep, but was suddenly woken up by being shaken, which he believed to be his work colleague. He walked around the flat until he found the other worker, who was up a ladder on the opposite side of the building. There was no way he could have moved so quick. It's believed that a woman committed suicide at some point on the first floor. St. Leonard's Church originates from Norman times. During the English Civil War, it was used as an ammunition store and it was blown up, which spread a great fire that swept through the town. The church was rebuilt in 1662 and it was restored in the 19th century. The ghost of a soldier from the English Civil War is often seen walking along the front of St. Leonard's Church. Many of the residents who live nearby have seen him crossing the road and walking onto the church grounds. One morning, a couple were visiting St. Leonard's Church when they could hear the organ being played. They went into the church and could still hear the music. They walked near the organ and the music suddenly stopped. But no one was sat at the instrument. The ghost of an elderly woman wearing lace-up boots and a black hat, decorated with fake cherries, it has also been seen near St. Leonard's Steps. During their rounds, two policemen used to meet up each night at the bottom of Granary Steps. One night they heard footsteps coming down the steps, and when they looked up, they saw a lady, who they described as good-looking, but with a pale, waxy face, and wearing a long black cape and lace-up boots. They were concerned as it was so late. So as she approached them, they asked if she was all right, and she replied, yes, thank you, and carried on walking towards the cartway. The next night, the same thing happened again. This went on for four nights in a row. On the fourth night, they decided to follow the woman. She took her usual route, they followed her around the corner and she completely disappeared. When Bridgenorth was a trading port, the cartway was the roughest part of town. It was so bad that gates were installed at the top and the bottom of the road to protect the people of Bridgenorth from the rough drunken sailors. The cartway boasted over 30 pubs, numerous brothels, and boarding houses from the top to the bottom. The Black Boy pub was first licensed in 1790, but it dates back to the 17th century and is believed that it was named after Charles II. His mother, Henrietta Maria, nicknamed Charles Black Boy due to his dark skin and eyes. It was a popular pub with the sailors when Bridge North had a port. Poltergeist activity happens quite often. Many customers have experienced many things, including someone who was trying to make a phone call and an invisible force pulled on his arm, pulling the phone away from his ear. A previous landlady witnessed three different ghosts in different parts of the building. One was a lady dressed in a green dress who appears all over the building and in the cellar. The Bassa Villa pub was originally called the Beehive in the 16th century. It became the Magpie around 1780 and was later named Bassa Villa as it is today. There is a plaque outside of the pub that reads, In medieval times, the low town part of Bridge North was called Bassa Villa. Translated from Latin, this means the basin of the town. Laterally, this was changed to Lower Town. And as we all know it now, 
as Lothal. Years ago, it had a secret hatch for Sunday drinking, and there is a supposed secret tunnel that leads from the stables to the river, maybe used for smuggling goods in the past. Another plaque inside the pub tells the story of two children that died in the 17th century. A brother and sister, William and Charlotte, were playing hide and seek and both went into the cellar. The cellar locked behind them and they were trapped with no way of escaping. At the time, the River Severn was flooded and this day it burst its banks, flooding the cellar, causing the poor children to drown. The parents commissioned two marble busts of the children, which are still in the pub's garden today. Many people have claimed they've heard the voices of the children and crying coming from the cellar, calling for help. The ghost of a lady dressed in black mourning clothes is seen very often and is believed to be the mother of the children. She walks around the building looking sad and softly whimpering and sometimes laughing. Perhaps she's remembering happier times. In 2015, a member of staff at Bassa Villa was working in the cellar when the floor gave way, revealing a 10-inch hole in the floor. After inspecting the hole, it was recognised as an old well. The landlord had old sewerage plans that date back to the 1850s, and there is no mention of the well, but a local historian believes that it may have been connected to an old brewery called Castlegate Brewery. It's wondered now if the children had drowned in the well and not from the floods. In 2015, the landlord entered the bar one morning to find smashed glass all over the floor. When he checked the CCTV footage, it showed a glass from one of the shelves being thrown by an unseen hand and it smashed onto the floor. The Falcon Hotel in Lowtown was first licensed in 1820. In 1672, the hotel was owned by a man named John Singh. A local businessman known as Willie used to take his secretary for lunch at the hotel for many years. He always reserved the same table and always asked the staff not to tell his wife. One day, staff felt an uneasy presence at the table and a glass shattered. Later on, they heard the news that Willie had died. Sometime after Willie's death, his wife and family booked the same table that Willie used to book. Staff and regular diners said they could hear Willie in the background, talking and laughing. <laughs> after playing the Falcon one night, a husband and wife duo of musicians stayed over in a room that is situated in the oldest part of the building. When settling down for bed, the husband went to use the bathroom and the wife got into bed. He was met with a young girl who walked past him and through a wall. She disappeared in the corridor. His wife saw the girl from the bed too. In medieval times, there was a Franciscan friary in Bridge North. It stood in the poorer part of town between the bank on the River Severn and what is now Friary Street, just north of the bridge. The remains of one of its walls can still be seen amongst some modern housing. Not much is known about the Friary. When it was built, who founded it? But it's believed to have been built after 1224, when the Franciscans first came to England. But before 1244, when Henry III ordered a payment of 40 shillings to the friars of Bridgedorth towards the building of their church. The friary was ended on the 5th of August, 1538, during the dissolution of the monasteries. The remaining buildings were let out for various uses over the years, and by 1824, most of it was occupied by South Wales Carpet Factory. As the factory got bigger, using up more land, Coffins and many ancient relics from the friary were found. The carpet factory was demolished in 1989 for housing on the site. There's a story of a rogue monk known as Old Mo, who enjoyed the pleasures of life, much against his order. 
He would leave the friary and use many of the drinking establishments and visit the brothels. One day, the other monks from the friary decided that his ways must come to an end. They confronted him and bludgeoned him, poisoned him and then disposed of his body. No one is sure if he was dumped in the river or buried in the friary grounds. But his ghost has been seen all over Bridgenorth. During World War II, the old carpet factory was used to build parts for aeroplanes. A man working there one night had a fright when he saw a monk walking towards him. He described him as wearing a long grey habit tied at the waist by a rope cord. A woman who worked at the factory after the war was locking up late one night. She was the last person in the building. As she was going through the cloakroom in the old part of the factory, she saw a figure walking up the steps dressed in a habit. He moved silently and disappeared into a corridor. A man was walking his dog in the early 1950s. As he approached an entrance to the factory that leads to an underground part of the building, his dog started to howl. When the man looked around to see what he was howling at, he noticed a glowing figure entering the underground part of the factory that looked like a monk. The following account is from a man who worked at the carpet factory. It was November, about 6.30 p.m. I was in the stockroom. I looked up. I see him sort of hovering towards me. A tall chap, dressed in a monk's coat with the hood up. I didn't see his face, but I didn't hang around to say me hellos. I was off of me heels. I went up the ball and had a few brown owls. When I stayed in Bridge North, I found an amazing cottage that I heard for two nights. The cottage is called Dracup's Cottage, and once belonged to an artist named Anthony Dracup. The cottage was built in the 19th century and is one of many small quaint cottages on Railway Street that were originally built for the workers on the Seven Valley Railway. Before I arrived, I received a text message from the owner, Carolina, to tell me that there were snacks in the fridge, which were very welcomed. The street is kept wonderfully clean by the neighbours and everyone was so friendly. The cottage is full of surprises. I walked through the front door and the first thing I noticed was a grandfather clock, standing slightly crooked. Then I realised there was an Alice in Wonderland theme to the building. I walked into the kitchen and there was another door afterwards. As you open the door, medieval music starts to play. You walk forwards and you're in a huge cave. The cave was dug out by hand by the artist Anthony Draco and he added brickwork pillars which gives it a very medieval feel. It almost felt like being in a church, very peaceful. The bed was great, all made from wood that wouldn't look out of place in Lord of the Rings. There are two bedrooms, one for sleeping in and the other is a piece of art that has been preserved. Anthony Drake painted all four walls in this room. The details are great. It had a feel of Lowry meets Monty Python. I recommend the cottage to anyone who's planning to stay in Bridge North. The website to book the cottage is dracupscottage.co.uk and I'll put links on the social media pages. Thank you for listening to Ghost Tales by the Fireside. You can log on to the Facebook page, facebook.com Ghost Tales Podcast. You can also find us on Instagram at Ghost Tales Podcast. This podcast will be out monthly and is available on most podcast platforms. All music, research, writing, production, art and sound effects are all my own work.